My name is Mike Gabin and welcome to my KSP campaign. Today we're going to be designing a lifter for my space shuttle. So here we have the orbiter that I uh, designed and tested a few episodes ago and have since rechristened the Columbia. And uh, if you want to, you can follow the link to that particular episode. I talk about its design, I test it, I also talk about uh, re-entering it. How do you re-enter a space plane? But, uh, and land it again, of course. But uh, right now what I've done is I've got it now in the vehicle assembly building, obviously. I did at the end of that episode put it into the space plane hangar and ran it through the building queue because the space plane hangar at the time had really nothing better to do. So it made, uh, made use of that Kerbal construction time time to, uh, you know, put it to some good use. And I'm hoping that that will mean the final build time here in the vehicle assembly building will end up being proportionally less. And I do already have the payload in the cargo bay for this thing. Uh, I'll talk about the payload when I get the actual mission day. Right now, though, I want to talk about how do we get this thing into orbit. So I've already put a radial decoupler there on the side, and I'm just going to attach an external fuel tank. I just sort of picked one of them. Because right now I just want to talk about what the essential problem is. Now the one thing you want to make sure to do is to use a fuel line to attach the external fuel tank to your orbiter. That way the orbiter engines aren't draining the fuel in the orbiter. So you still have a fully fueled orbiter by the time you get into orbit. But let's talk about the essential problem. So there's the center of mass, there's the center of thrust, and you can see that they are in no way lined up. If I tried to fly this thing the way it is right now, it would dramatically pitch forward and I would have no ability to control that. Here is one way to fix this problem. A lot of people, what they like to do, let's see if I can click on it, is I'm gonna click using the rotation tool, I'm gonna to rotate those engines. And as I rotate the engines, you can see that I'm changing the direction of my thrust. And the problem is, you know, with what I had before, is that the, the direction of thrust wasn't through the center of mass. So you can rotate it so that it does go through the center of mass. And this is essentially what the US Space Shuttle did to solve this exact same problem, was to rotate those engines so they go through the center of mass. And that will work fine, except, I don't know, I don't particularly like this particular solution. What I don't like is that, uh, you end up flying sort of a bit sideways. So this is what I personally like to do. I mean, we don't have to do the same thing they did in real life. I just put an engine here at the bottom. Okay, that one's not gonna be big enough. You have to play around with different engines. That's looking a little bit closer. See, and that pulls the center of thrust uh, way over to the left here. So it's a little bit better lined up with the center of mass. Now this is not perfectly lined up. Um, so you, you, and you can tweak the thrusts on your various engines to try and get them to line up a little bit better. I'm also noticing that my thruster weight ratio of 1.79 feels a little bit low. I still have some solid rocket boosters to put on this thing. So this would be what it would be like sort of, you know, getting into the higher part of the atmosphere. I'd like the thruster weight ratio to be a little closer around 2. So you can put a bigger engine on it. You know, and this does take a lot of tweaking. You got to play with the tweaking of the thrust on the engines. Uh, you can do things like, here I got a little silly. I ended up putting these uh, little Rockomax radial engines on the side. Played around with the idea of maybe putting some of those radial thuds on the side. You can do all kinds of things. It, it, you know, it, don't be afraid to just, you know, to play around. You don't have to emulate what was done in real life. I mean, unless that's your thing, of course. You could certainly emulate the real thing if you want to, but me, KSP, I like to emulate function rather than form. But, uh, you know, to each their own. But anyway, why don't we get on to uh, building the rest of this uh, liquid fuel booster. It's not an external fuel tank now, of course. It is a booster. So we're going to add some more stuff here on the top. Uh, number one is I want, yeah, I, I want to put in an adapter. I want to sh get down to 1.25 meters. There we go. That's the one I want. And then I'm going to put on an RCS tank up there at the top. The uh, 1.25 meter RCS tank. Nope, that's the smaller one. Yeah, that's the little one. I don't want that one. This one, because I will be using the RCS 
uh, for at least part of the flight on the way up. You'll see, I'll explain why in just a little bit. And then we'll put one of these uh, nose comb parachute things that come from real shoots up there at the top. Okay, well, we got to fix up the staging here. This all got a little bit messed up. Parachute will put up to the top because I'll arm that manually. And that radial decoupler will put right there. All the engines on the bottom. There we go. That is, that's it for now. Okay, now, one of the things we're very used to with our rockets is that the center of mass moves, but in a regular rocket, the center of mass just moves down, which is okay. It still remains lined up with the center of thrust, but here I'll show you, as this tank drains, the center of mass moves towards the orbiter, getting it even further offline with the uh, center of thrust, and that is going to be a problem. So as you start to move, you know, uh, the, the center of thrust and the center of mass are going to be more and more off from each other. There are a number of ways of dealing with this. How the real space shuttle dealt with it is that the engines on the orbiter were gimbaled so that they would adjust to keep the center of thrust in line with the center of mass. That's not very practical in KSP. Another solution is to have multiple tanks on your uh, fuel tank and pump fuel up and down to move the center of mass up and down to try and keep it in line with the center of thrust. Uh, that's an option. I personally find that kind of a pain. Another option is you can adjust with this configuration I have the thrust on the engine, particularly on the main engine on the bottom of the liquid fuel booster. You can adjust that thrust, specifically bringing it down. That can work. Um, the problem is, is as you bring your thrust down, of course, low thrust might not be the best thing in the world for getting yourself into orbit. This is the simplest thing you can do right off the bat. Now, where are they? Here they are. Uh, get these Werner engines. These are uh, RCS engines. They work with the RCS system. They're omnidirectional. They only go in one direction, but they work off of liquid fuel and oxidizer rather than monoprop. And they provide a reasonable amount of force. So I'm going to put a pair of them right up here to provide a counter force, a torque force really, that will try you know, to counter off the offset between the center of thrust and the center of mass. Uh, and if you want more counter force, you can actually put more of them down towards the bottom of the rocket on the opposite side. That will work as well. And uh, the thing with the control various control systems that are in KSP is they're all fairly overpowered compared to real life. Uh, the reaction wheels, which I'm adding in right now, are overpowered compared to real life. Uh, RCS is overpowered. The control surfaces on the orbiter are overpowered. So you can get away with slight offsets with the center of mass and the center of thrust uh, in a variety of different ways. But once you feel like you sort of have this part to a point where it looks like it might fly under some control. It's time to add on some additional boosters. Now I went with SRB, solid rocket boosters, because I'm a bit of a traditionalist, but you could go with liquid fuel easy enough. You could asparagus stage them if you feel like that's the way you want to go, where the main tank is feeding fuel into those liquid fuel boosters on the side. But uh, uh, it looked to me like SRBs were going to work for me, so that's what I went with, two SRBs over here on the side. And then after that comes a whole lot of engine tweaking. Now at launch, it's really important to have the center of thrust and the center of mass lined up as close as you can. You're launching obviously from a speed of zero. And uh, at, a, you know, at very low speeds, the various, especially the control surfaces on the orbiter, won't be doing anything. Um, once it gets going at a good speed, it will have more of a tendency to want to keep going in a straight line, especially with the fact that uh, if you're going at a quick speed in the lower part of the atmosphere, um, those control surfaces on the orbiter uh, are significant, and uh, they'll help you keep going in a straight line. But at launch, you want things lined up pretty well. But you got to do a little bit better than that. You also want to look at thrust-to-weight ratios. I like to have a thrust-to-weight ratio of about 1.65 or so, and I got that right on. Uh, after all of my tweaking and Kerbal Engineers telling me that uh, when the SRBs detach, I'll have a thrust to weight ratio of 3.11. Feels good. And uh, when it's once the SRBs are gone and it's just on the three liquid fueled engines, it'll have a thrust to weight ratio of 2.15. So that will be at that sort of 
mid ascent point, and that also feels good. So I think uh, I'm closing in on uh, giving this thing a first simulated test run. Okay, and we'll get rid of this contract plus window. I we'll need that. And we'll open up uh, KOS. Uh, I'm going to use my standard KOS launch script that I've used for all of my launches. Um, I don't want to modify this thing just for the for a space shuttle. So it, you know, I want to get it to fly with this standardized script. So we're going to set it to go into an inclination of zero. So it'll go straight east and shoot for an altitude of 80 degree, 80 kilometers. All right, three, two, one, and go. Oh, and right over, it's pitching over. Let's put the RCS on. <laughs> okay, so there's obviously a bit of a misalignment between the center of thrust and the center of mass, but we'll see how this thing deals with it. Yeah, I can't put any more thrust into those orbiter engines, so it's gonna have to work with what it has. But it seems to be settling out. Yeah, it's not pitching over anymore, and it seems to be coming back. It definitely is. Okay, it's going to start into its gravity turn now. You can see it starting to turn over east. And I'm not doing any of this. This is just the script, and it really seems to be in some semblance of control. Oh, and it's rolling over to an inverted attitude. I always like going, I don't know, all my launches I roll with an inverted attitude. You probably never noticed it before, but now you can tell for sure that I do that. And now it seems remarkably stable. You can see the RCS and the burner engines working really hard, but uh, they are getting the job done. This, by the way, is not the only configuration that you can use in order to get a space plane up into orbit. Um, there are more symmetrical ways of doing it. For instance, uh, you could do like the uh, Dream Chaser, that Sierra Nevada, that's recently been in the news because it won a contract recently to supply the International Space Station and what it it's a reusable space plane and what it does is it puts the space plane on the top of a large booster underneath a fairing a small space plane but that's the thing you can do in Kerbal Space Program also although I've never seen this done in real life I've done it in Kerbal Space Program where you just surround your space shuttle with boosters and have it all symmetrical and speaking about well, I guess asymmetrical, I have definitely lost this. <laughs> Remember, the center of mass is moving, and it moves towards the orbiter, and obviously the center of mass and the center of thrust are too far out of alignment now for it to uh, keep holding its attitude. But uh, let's see what happens when we lose the boosters. They're just about dry. There they go. Oh. I think I need to put some separatrons on those. <laughs> but let's see if it can regain control here. I'm not doing anything. Again, this is completely KOS, and it is no longer spinning about, and it seems to be bringing itself around. Nice. Ooh, look at all the monoprop. This monoprop can can be empty by the time I ditch it, so... Uh, I should lose, I should definitely, I don't need nearly that much monoprop to get rid of some of that. But look at that, it's getting back on its proper trajectory, rolling back around. Oh, I'm pretty pleased with that. I mean, obviously I gotta do some tweaking, but the fact that it's able to do that, that, that makes me happy. Yeah, as I was saying, yeah, try, try other configurations. I've launched space shuttles where I just symmetrically put boosters in around the space shuttle with the space shuttle in the middle. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe it's not traditional. Maybe it looks goofy, but by gum, it works. Okay, so let's try that again, but this time what I'll do is I'll start the launch with the RCS on right from the beginning. Hopefully that will make uh, the launch a little bit cleaner and clean up the, the beginning part of that particular set. We'll also run this at two times speed just so this will go a little bit quicker now that we're seeing it for a second time. So again, exactly the same. We're going to go due east, shoot for an altitude of 80 kilometers, RCS on, and go. And you can see what a difference that makes. It's still wanting to pitch over a little more than what I would want it to, but uh, certainly much better than before. 
Okay, it's starting its gravity turn, so there's the roll. Yeah, I certainly do want to get the I want to get the center of thrust a little bit more centered with the center of mass, but that was a lot better just simply putting on the RCS right from the beginning. And it was able to hold its attitude right to booster separation this time. There they go. Yeah, the difference this time is without all of that time it's spent going in the wrong direction, um, the Columbia's had much more of an opportunity to pick up speed. And with speed, once you, if you're in the atmosphere, comes control because those control surfaces are more effective the faster that you go. So it was able to hold its attitude all the way up. Okay, well, maybe not all the way up. Because the issue is, of course, is the air is getting thinner and thinner all the time. And although I'm going faster, the control surfaces on the orbiter are becoming less and less effective with that thinner air. In addition, the center of mass is moving closer and closer to the orbiter as the fuel drains from that central tank. And, uh, yeah, there it begins to go. It can't hold it anymore. And, yeah, I've lost it. But really, for a first prototype, man, I cannot complain about this. But, uh, yeah, back to the VAB. And I won't show you my time in the VAB. Instead, I'll come back to the product of that little bit of tweaking. Not too many things changed. But I'll get to that in just a second. Let's get this thing off the pad. Again, same KOS launch script, same ascent profile. RCS on, and we're off. And you can see I still do have a little bit of an issue with uh, initial thrust and center of mass lining up. This time going the other way, though not nearly as bad as last time. And it's rolling to its inverted attitude. And looking pretty good, I think. And there we are starting its gravity turn, and I am so confident in how well balanced it is, I just turned the RCS off. So it's just relying on the control surfaces and on the balance between thrust and all that stuff. And speaking of control surfaces, surfaces <laughs> that's one of the changes that I made is I added some tail fins to the opposite side of those boosters to help bring the center of lift a little bit more in line with the center of mass. Not quite perfectly in line. In fact, it's not very close to being perfectly in line, but it definitely is helping. And then the other thing I did is I replaced the LV-909 engines that were on the orbiter with the radial thud engines because they have more thrust and they actually have a bigger gimbling range, so I figured that would help as well. And you can see it is ascending rather beautifully, if I do say so myself. RCS still off. We are coming now to SRB separation. This time I did put some separatrons on those SRBs. And the separatrons didn't fire for some reason. Okay, well at least they didn't explode. <laughs> well, I'll have to investigate why that happened. And now that the SRBs are gone and we've had some change in the thrust profile, I put the RCS back on, but you can see it's not working nearly as hard as it was before. I also took out most of the monoprop, about two-thirds of the monoprop in the booster. This is not, by the way, using any of the monoprop that is in the orbiter. Oh, we'll take a look from the inside here, all flamey and stuff. This will be great once we get all the screens going. Anyway, back out here. Um, as I was saying, it's not using any of the monoprop from the orbiter because of the fuel line that goes from the uh, fuel tank to the orbiter. So all the monoprop is just coming out of the external fuel tank, well, the liquid fuel booster. So as far as I'm concerned, there could be zero monoprop at the time when I separate this thing. Okay, so 35 kilometers, still looking good, and a control surface is stuck. Well, whatever. I just had main engine cut off. Uh, I will be in space soon. Control surfaces do not matter. Man, yeah, there it is. It's that front canard. Stupid dang it. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, that all went very well. And so the script is going to be ending once we get it 50 kilometers. And then after that, it is manual control. Okay, boosters got recovered. Nice. We are now a manual control. Put that on prograde. 
and drift on up. And what's nice about manual control is now I can control the amount of thrust. It's not going to be full thrust all the time. The other thing you can do too, by the way, uh, as far as controlling, you know, you saw me flip out on my previous ascent. One of the things I could have done was simply turn down the thrust as it went up, not with the shift key and the control key on the keyboard, but just by right clicking on an engine and, and putting the thrust limiter down, that would have helped as well, but I don't know. You can do that if you like. I kind of like being able to go up without having to tweak anything. There's something satisfying, I find, in doing that. So, put the RCS back on. And we are firing up and attempting to circularize. You definitely need RCS once you're in space because the control surfaces aren't doing anything. And Oh, I'm losing it. Now at the time I thought I just had the thrust up too high, but in fact the uh, liquid fuel booster has just gone dry and I haven't realized it yet, so I'm dragging it around uselessly. Okay, I just realized it now. <laughs> and now we'll complete our circularization. And I am really low on fuel and that's it. I am out of fuel. And part of the issue was that the ascent was a little bit sloppy. But the bigger issue became apparent once I was back in the vehicle assembly building. If you take a look at what Kerbal Engineer is telling me here, it says that at the end of stage three, there it will have expelled a total of 3,509 meters per second of delta V. The problem with that is that actually is consuming all the fuel of the orbiter. And the orbiter, of course, should be full so they can get back down and do what it needs to do. And I was thrown by stage one. I thought stage one was the orbiter, but that is actually the payload that is in the orbiter. That threw me off. So I actually need to have a little over 3,500 meters per second of delta V by the end of stage four. And you can see here I only have 3,104 meters per second. So even if I didn't fly sloppily, I wasn't going to get... I could have maybe just barely got this thing into orbit and then probably wouldn't have been able to get it back down again. Uh, so <laughs> that was just me being confused, but that was a pretty easy thing to fix. All I need to do is scale the whole thing up a little bit to give myself a little bit more delta V. And I think I'm going to wait until uh, actual launch day to show you the final product. I've talked enough about uh, the principles behind designing the lifter. You've seen me do a couple of trials. I think you've got the idea. You will most certainly be seeing this shuttle again. In fact, the build time for it was only 12 days. That's thanks to the orbiter having already been built once out of the space plane hangar. Uh, but in the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you next time.